What's up everyone? Welcome to this issue of Jet 200 version 4 where we take you under the skin of Jet 200. This issue we're tackling suspension and brakes. This is obviously one of the most important parts of the car as our handling and stopping are very important in terms of lap times. Now we run in open class and world time attack which means the suspension modifications are heavily regulated so we have to work within those rules and do the best that we can. So let's take a look at the suspension and brakes on the car to show you why we chose the parts, how they all work. Let's go. Now let's start with the coilovers on the car. These are actually a custom built unit by Wilkinson Suspension in Western Australia. Now these have been on the car for quite a while. Originally they were quite soft, 200 and 300 pound. Now that worked really well on this car when it had very limited aero and a small tyre. In fact, we drove the car to a 62.2 at Wakefield uh, on such a small tyre and pretty much no aero. But since we've moved to a 295 tyre, wider rims and more aero, we need a stiffer spring rate to help cope uh, with the extra force. We've now switched to a 350 and 450 pound spring rate. We're going to try that first and see if it's stiff enough and then go from there. Now Wilkinson Suspension custom built the entire coilover body. Uh, it has camber and caster adjustment on the top plate of this. Uh, it uses a King spring and it uses a Kony Motorsport adjustable shock absorber on the inside. So it's a pretty cool unit and uh, we'll be developing these further as we see how the aero uh, affects the suspension on this car more and more. It's a bit of a black art, you can't just guess it and get it right. You uh, need to try things and develop it to get it spot on. Now most people consider the coilovers to be the most important part of the suspension but there's still a lot you can do with suspension geometry in the car. Now it's pretty normal that you see people upgrade with adjustable suspension arms. There's two reasons you do it. One is to allow more adjustment in the car and secondly is because most aftermarket arms have some type of strengthened uh, joint on them whether it's a spherical bearing that they use or a rose joint uh, or some just use a, like a hardened urethane joint. Now all of our arms on the front have been replaced. Uh, these are circuit sports, but let's be honest, they uh, pretty much all come from the same factory, painted a different colour. Uh, we use adjustable caster rods and adjustable lower control arm. This lower control arm has a roll centre adjuster built into the rose joint on the outside that spaces the arm away from the knuckle. Now because this is a McPherson strut front end, we didn't feel the need for a drop spindle style knuckle to help with geometry as we can simply just space the arm away from the knuckle. Uh, we don't have to worry about an upper arm having a different camber curve. Now another thing we've done with this car to change the geometry at the front and work within the rules of World Time Attack is we've actually fabricated some new suspension pickup points on the inside. Now we've always had the one on the lower control arm to help with roll centre adjustment but what we found is it's actually changed the angle of the two front arms uh, which helps reduced dive which is making our brakes not be as effective. So what we've done is we've now manufactured here at CS Engineering another suspension pickup point uh, for the caster rod at the front that's 30 millimetres higher and essentially what that does is change the inclination of the entire front suspension to allow the car to really push in on the front suspension uh, and get better braking. So we've actually increased dive in the front um, because we were having brake problems before based on that geometry. Now in the World Time Attack rules it says that you are allowed to modify your suspension pickup points by design and by strength but they must remain, however the rules don't stipulate that you actually have to use that pickup point. So the factory pickup points still remain, we've just decided to use some different ones in the front to help try and repair the geometry. So those holes have not only given us some roll centre adjustment but they've also given us better dive to make the brakes be more effective on the front. Uh, the sway bar, off the shelf, white line, heavy duty sway bar, adjustable, uh, we had to make our own bracket though to sit it where we wanted it. Now although our knuckle is based on a factory unit, uh, Nigel Petrie from Engineer to Slide modified uh, where the tie rod end joins to it. It's actually been moved to have bump steer correction. It's got slightly quicker steering than factory but we haven't changed the Ackerman. Uh, reducing Ackerman in a drift car is good but reducing it in a circuit car is bad uh, as you want that inside wheel to turn a little bit more on turning to uh, give you better cornering. Uh, we obviously use an aftermarket tie rod end. You can put spaces into it to help get the bump steer where you want it. Uh, we've still yet to set that up exactly how we like it. And obviously we're using aftermarket and strengthened tie rods as well. So every single arm in the front end has been replaced. We've modified bump steer, we've modified roll centre and we've modified the dive in the front end as well. So there's a lot going on up here. Uh, a lot you can adjust and a lot you can play around with. 
Let's go to the rear suspension now, check out what's going on there. Now rear suspension is almost a black art with the Silvia. Everyone has a different theory. Uh, drifters have their way of doing it. Time Attack guys have a few different ideas. It's not the world's greatest suspension geometry design from factory, uh, but with a little bit of work, you can get it working quite well. Uh, there's two important things you have to worry about with Silvia rear end suspension, and that is weight transfer to try and get power down, so how well it squats at the back. But when you look at that, you also need to take into consideration the camber curve on the rear of the car because if you get too much camber curve on the rear of a Sylvia, uh, you then lose traction even though you've got good weight transfer. So uh, they're the one of the two most important things you have to look at. Now let's start with the coilover again. Uh, once again, Wilkinson Suspension custom designed coilover. Uh, it's a 350 pound king spring in it now. Uh, it used to only be 200. We've had to obviously go stiffer due to the wider tyres and the aero, as we were saying before. Uh, like the front, we've got aftermarket adjustable suspension arms. We've got adjustable traction rod, adjustable camber arm, uh, adjustable toe arm. That's all pretty straightforward stuff for modifying the rear end. Well, let's take a look at the tricky bits. Now, we went for a Driftworks rear knuckle on this car because essentially all it does is raise the hub 50 millimetres uh, on the knuckle. So essentially what it does is you're actually lowering the car 50 millimetres without changing the suspension itself. The good thing about that is if you want to lower the rear end of the car, you keep factory suspension geometry uh, which obviously is a much better camber curve than if you lower it too much. Sylvia's have a real problem where if you slam the car too far, even though you can put a roll centre adjuster into the lower arm and get the lower arm level, the top camber arm is uh, facing quite a fair way up and because it's so aggressively up, once you squat you get a very, very massive camber gain very quickly. So keeping the camber arm level is actually the most important thing in the geometry. And the Driftworks knuckle allows you to keep the lower arm and the camber arm level as opposed to a roll centre adjuster which only worries about the lower arm. Now we used to have roll centre adjusted con lower control arms in this car before, but because we've moved to the Driftworks knuckle, we've actually gone back to a factory lower control arm. Obviously we replaced the ball joint to brand new and we put new bushes on the inside that are strengthened. Chris also welded in some reinforcement to that lower arm to make it stronger as they're pretty flimsy from factory. Uh, but another big thing we did is actually modify the geometry of the lower arm as well. So where the pickup at the front of the lower control arm is, we've made a whole new pickup point that's roughly 50 to 60 millimetres lower than what it is from factory. Now essentially what that does is, instead of the lower control arm being angled up at the front, it's now completely level. Jun actually does this on GTR subframes to help get better traction by allowing more squat in the rear. So we've actually, with this change, allowed to have more squat in the rear and more dive in the front. Previously, Chris from CS Engineering also strengthened our subframe, uh, where the camber and traction rod joins to the subframe is quite weak. So we've just boxed that section in. Another support bar between the uh, toe arms in the back as well, and obviously we've got all solid mounts in our rear subframe, so there is absolutely no movement whatsoever in the subframe, and obviously with every bush either being rose jointed or urethane in the arms, nothing can go anywhere. Now sway bar, just like the front, is a white line adjustable item as well. Uh, we've had to space it down a little bit to help clear the lower arms after we move the front pickup point. Uh, so as you can see, we've got a lot to develop in the rear end, and uh, we'll be playing around with that once we hit the track. But uh, with these changes, we're pretty confident not only can we get more traction at the back with better squat, uh, the camber curve is going to be reduced, so we're going to have better corner exit traction as well. Now braking has been a big problem on Jet 200 since the very beginning. We've tried a lot of different caliper and rotor combinations at the front, we've tried different master cylinders, uh, but we've never had the brakes work anywhere near effective enough. In fact, I'm surprised we ever did the lap times that we did with the brakes as bad as they were. What we were finding before, when we had a factory brake booster and a factory style master cylinder, uh, we would have asymmetric braking on the front, uh, one would lock up before the other, and we simply couldn't get enough bias into the rear. We tried different master cylinders, we tried different calipers and rotors, none of them worked, so essentially we decided with the braking system on Jet 200, tear it all off, start again. Now the central point of our braking system is the Wheelwood pedal box. We went for a firewall mounted pedal box uh, for a few reasons. One is cost, they're a lot cheaper. Uh, and secondly is it allowed the driving position to remain similar to before. And also we found if we did a floor mounted pedal box, 
The seat would have to be pushed so far back, the cage would have to be remade, the steering column would have to be remade. So going for a firewall mounted pedal box uh, was a lot easier packaging and price wise. Obviously choosing a pedal box means we choose our master cylinder sizes to suit the front and rear brakes as well as the clutch and also means we can swap them easily. And there's also a balance bar for the front and rear brake, so we can adjust the bias. Now, Chris had to fabricate a bracket to hold the pedal box to the firewall. Uh, the good thing about that is we removed the booster. We have a lot more room in the engine bay now. We also fabricated some extra brackets to hold the pedal box to the a roll cage bar under the dash, because the factory Nissan firewall, let's face it, it's pretty flimsy, so when you put your foot on the brakes, firewall would actually move. So we've reinforced it to the roll cage instead. It's still completely removable though, and that gives it a lot better strength and better pedal feel. Uh, we also decided to put all new brake lines in the car. The only piece of factory brake line now is the split in the rear brakes. Uh, so all new Dash 3 braided Teflon brake lines uh, from the pedal box to the back via the hydraulic handbrake. For the front brakes, a line goes to the center of the car, splits into two, so we have equal length. Instead of running it through the engine bay, we've actually run it through a bulkhead in the firewall straight into the wheel arch. So the brake lines don't go anywhere near the engine, near the exhaust or turbo so they can't get hot. Uh, and obviously we've separated it on the bulkhead so we can remove the brake line between the bulkhead and the caliper itself. Now moving on to the brakes, uh, we already had these Greddy Alcon six piston calipers. Uh, we bought them second hand. We just had them completely rebuilt, all new seals, uh, so we know that they're fresh and good to go. Uh, and we've had the guys from Motorsport Brakes come on board to try and help us get these brakes to work. And what they've done is supplied us with uh, a new rotor and pad combo. Now we've gone for Winmax brake pads. Now these are designed to work cold, but still work at high temperatures. Our old brake pads were too aggressive. Uh, when they were cold, they would just either bite and lock up or do nothing. Uh, and were very, very aggressive onto the rotor as well and actually tore up the rotor quite a fair bit. These new pads should give us better feel. Uh, they're going to work on the outlap. They're also less aggressive on the rotor uh, and they're a little bit, the compound's a little bit softer so therefore we should have better pedal feel as well. Uh, another thing the guys from Motorsport Brakes did for us is actually custom made uh, this rotor assembly for this car. So what they had to do is they went and custom made this hat which has a full floating uh, rotor so it has bobbin pins on it. This allows for expansion in the rotor disc which is a different material to the hat. Uh, it basically slides in and out on these pins, uh, which is obviously better for the brake stops distortion. Uh, it's better with heat transfer. It helps reduce pad knockoff as well. Uh, so they've custom made that. But what they did, instead of doing it with say an Alcon or a, an AP or whatever rotor, they've actually made it to suit a DBA two-piece rotor. And because it's available and made in Australia from DBA, it means we can get it quicker and easier uh, than what we could and cheaper than any overseas rotors. So that was the benefit of custom making the hat. Uh, the other thing we've also done with this rotor uh, is gone up in size. So this used to be a 355 millimeter brake kit. Now this new rotor measures 365 millimeters. So pretty large brakes on the front. Uh, I don't think we're ever gonna run out of brakes on the front now. And obviously it's gonna be cheaper and easier to repair than the old rotors that were on there. Better pads, brakes should work a lot better than before. Now let's take a look at the rear brakes on the car. They're pretty straightforward. They are almost the same as what they were before this overhaul. I was told they came off an R34 GTR V-Spec 2 NUR, but the rotor itself uh, ended up being a 350Z item. Now that means that it's 324 mil rotors on the back instead of 300 like on a GTR. It's a ventilated rotor on the back now because of it's a 350Z rotor, which is obviously better for cooling. And the Brembo two piston caliper has W3 Winmax pads inside. And we also use a braided brake line. So they're not enormous, but the car's not too heavy. We've got plenty at the front, plenty at the back. Brakes will be good.